All right, let me set the context for the video. Um, over the last one year, I've spent a decent chunk of my time understanding how companies are hiring, what are they hiring for, and what is the easier or faster path to get a job. In this video, I'm going to summarize a lot of obvious points you might have seen. Companies not hiring very actively, extremely long interview cycles, they're not being enough FOMO in the market to uh, hire engineers. What has changed? Will it get better? And what can you do to adapt yourself in this newly changing job market in tech? With that, let's get right into the video. Let's move to the first point. One very obvious point I've seen over the last one year is that founders are in deep conservation mode. By which I mean, um, there's one thing to not actively hire, uh, but then there's just another thing to stop hiring altogether. Um, and there's no good reason for this. I think uh, tech was a field that was very FOMO driven. Um, if you could build a product quickly, it felt like you'd have first mover advantages. Um, but now everyone's building products slowly. Um, everyone knows there's a market, but they're focusing more on distribution now. Um, I think a lot of startups have been built, a lot of money has been raised, and a lot of startups have failed. Um, for entrepreneurs to realize that uh, building the product quick um, or FOMOing into the product and hiring a lot of engineers um, is probably not the right approach initially. As a result, a very common statement I hear when I've talked to founders is that we're not actively hiring. As a result, interview processes are stretched out, uh, sometimes spanning many weeks and a lot of times not leading anywhere without any fault of the interviewee. If you are stuck in this cycle, most probably it's not your fault. It's just how the market is right now. And I don't see it changing very quickly um, unless, you know, you see the same kind of FOMO we saw a few years ago in building products um, and building them quick and hiring being a metric for founders rather than sales or revenue. With that, we'll move to the second point. The second point is around productivity because of AI. I think it's very obvious uh, that engineers are much more productive today than three years ago when ChatGPT was introduced. Um, and that would obviously lead to less hiring. A good example of this is my very first remote job uh, or freelance project was a six month project where I was building a simple multiplayer game um, for a client in the US for $4,000 a month over a span of six months. Today, if someone is wanting to build that, I think they understand somewhere or the other that engineers can be more productive. So it's not necessary that they'll be able to build it using AI, uh, but probably, you know, I'd only get hired for three months or at, you know, $3,000 a month. Um, because founders, you know, um, you can be more productive now. And a lot of things were sort of an unbuildable a few years ago. Um, and now at least some version of it you can show using Lovable. Um, so founders would probably use that as an advantage um, and hope that, you know, engineers move much faster, which is a good expectation to have as well. At the same time, I feel founders um, either overestimate what AI can do or a lot of time force engineers to, you know, just use cursor and not code at all. That probably is a bad approach. I think you'll probably hit a wall really quickly if AI is coding everything without any engineer um, or if you're forcing the engineer to use AI aggressively. The truth is for building any product, um, you know, it was earlier also very easy to take it to a 90% and today it's become much easier. But the last 10% is where you would require the context of a good engineer. If you are three times more productive in building the first 90% of the product now, you're probably still equally productive in the last 10%. Unfortunately, it takes some time for people to realize here the last 10% is where you really need an engineer. And if the first 90% is also being built by that engineer, they'll probably move faster in the last 10%. Long story short, AI has made people more productive and hence there's less hiring. A lot of founders feel like they don't need engineers or don't need enough engineers or that engineers can move at impossible speeds because of AI, because of which they have unrealistic expectations. And hence, they don't hire as aggressively or would, you know, hire for short term roles. With that, we'll move to the third point. Um, and this is around something that was very true before and probably is even more true today is that referrals are giving um, an extreme unfair advantage right now. It feels like there are so many engineers in the market. And if a job posting is put forward, thousands of people are going to apply. So most of the times you're talking to a good engineer to hire the next person. Um, use this unfair advantage as much as possible. If you have a brother, a sister who currently works in a company, let's take an example, let's say your big brother works at Atlassian. Um, there's a very high probability he'll know the path and he'll have the networks to get you placed at, if not Atlassian, a different big tech company where a bunch of their buddies work. One strong referral is probably equivalent to you applying for 300 jobs randomly. If you don't already have this unfair advantage, you can try to build it by moving to, you know, um, probably tech cities like Bangalore and trying to be closer to founders and engineers. The unfair advantage of a network, uh, or more specifically a referral in this case, has been amplified today simply because there are too many people who are applying. 
With that, we'll transition the video into a different segment. Until this point, I've talked about what's wrong with the market. Uh, now I'm going to talk through what can you do personally or what might be wrong uh, in your personal strategy. What can you fix to increase your chances of getting hired? These are actionable steps, irrespective of where the market moves. Point number one, um, don't endlessly wait for that perfect offer. Don't try to optimize for an IIT day zero offer. Don't optimize for 40 LPA uh, when you don't have a job right now or if you have graduated a year ago and have been unemployed or even if you're just you know a pure fresher in tech. Get that first offer that gets you in the door. That doesn't necessarily mean you take um, an extremely inferior offer. I think for an internship, anything below 25k a month is a little weird. And for a full-time offer, I think a 6 LPA should be like a basic expectation, if not 8 LPA. Um, but that's like a good starting point. If you're optimizing beyond that, without any other offer, without any other backup, uh, you're probably shooting yourself in the foot. The path to eventually reach wherever, 40 LPA, 50 LPA or CR, um, becomes much easier and faster if you're currently in the industry, rather than trying to chase perfection through your personal projects. So always remember, um, you can only negotiate hard or reach higher salaries if you have something to back down on. Um, the person who wins in a negotiation is the person who's willing to stand from the table. You'll only be able to do that if you have something to fall back on. With that, we'll move to the next point. Be ready from day zero. Gone are the days where you know a little bit of CS and get into an internship batch and hope for a pre-placement offer by the end. Um, today, you're expected to hit the ground running as soon as you join at least a startup or a mid-sized company. This is definitely true for remote companies where you have a lot of self-accountability. But even for on-site startups, unfortunately, the joy of you know training a junior engineer ha has slowly gone away because AI can do a bunch of things. So it just becomes annoying if, you know, someone a doesn't know bare minimum. Um, the expectation isn't that you're a senior engineer, but it's also that you know much more um, than, you know, what was expected before. Good examples of this are if you're joining a company, you know the tech stack really well. You understand Git, GitHub really well. You don't do dumb, small, basic mistakes. Um, even if you're joining as a fresher, you should have the ability to lead projects end to end, um, understand you know, some processes. You don't need to know everything. You need to be perfect in the product that you are building on or the specific, you know, microservice that you're working on. But at the same time, you know, it just shows more higher agency if you are picking things that are out of your scope of work or at least understand, um, you know, how the, for example, DevOps pipeline runs or, you know, where the code is being deployed or, or how do you do integration checks, whatever. Um, the point is, um, the days where you have, you know, let's say five files to code on and you just keep doing that for a year are sort of gone. Um, you're expected to own more things and you'll only be able to do that if you have certain level of skills, um, if you have some basic skills in multiple niches, um, you're probably really good at what you do. This doesn't mean that code bases of companies is, are fairly optimal. They're the dumbest code bases. If you're doing a personal project, you'll probably write cleaner code than what you might find in a bigger company. The reason for that is that startups need to move really quickly and a lot of times need to take tough decisions around maintaining the code versus moving fast. So it's not like the code base or the team um, or whatever startup you're joining is going to be perfect. Um, but the expectation as an interviewee would be, you know, um, okay, if you do join the team, you're increasing the net, you know, product activity or uh, engineering mindset or the knowledge of the team. The net curve of, you know, technical abilities of a company should go up over time. And that's something that companies optimize for really heavily. With that, we'll move to the next point. Learn to write uh, clean, maintainable code. I think this is specifically a problem with Indian devs. I don't know why. Uh, probably because they don't understand a lot of their code. Probably because they're following a tutorial. I think this is true in DSS. Well, you'll find a lot of people saying, okay, I've done 500 lead code problems, yet I'm not getting a job. Um, and the answer usually is, okay, you know, we've sort of been ingrained to give an examination and prepare really well for it. And, you know, we just hope that one specific day, everything sort of remains in syllabus. But computer science has so many paths and journeys specifically in the code that you can write the logic can't really be learned um, you need to sort of learn first principles thinking and ask a lot of questions and understand the problem statement and then try to answer the interview question with the best of your abilities this is where uh, experiential learning helps um, if you have coded a lot for example in javascript uh, then most probably if someone is asking you a question in javascript um, you'll be able to answer it even if this is something new or out of syllabus because you have some basic first principles thinking you have some level of muscle memory so you've seen too many things that let you answer this specific problem statement well. This specific habit of coding a lot yourself, writing clean code and asking a lot of questions while designing products and understanding the architecture has incremental effects. It will sustain your career and your learning much more than, you know, following a tutorial or just trying to put a project out there without actually understanding it. 
with that we'll move to the next point the next point is around generally changing your mindset about cs and how it is functioning at the moment this is especially true if you're young and early for example you know first year students here at hanex school um cs is not what it used to be um and i think you know when you were in school you probably imagined a certain future of getting a one year offer uh, from you know whatever i don't know an iit um that was hard in the first place um and probably that layer won't be affected at all like i think people will still make one year offers at an sft um but the mid layer right below it um, or the lower layer uh, of you know people getting lower offers easy is or even mid size offers of 8 lp 10 lp will get tougher and tougher this doesn't really mean that the opportunity sort of gone and you know it's only downhill from here the good thing is that you know we finally had some successful ipos in the country uh, zomato paytm being good examples um uh, a lot of tech ecosystem in the us was built because of you know meta before that paypal uh, and now we're seeing similar mafias in the country so there'll definitely be more tech startups people who've made their money building tech startups as employees are eventually going to be founders themselves um there's also equal amount of consumption in the country and you know the hope is that the consumption levels up here become equivalent to you know what china had over the last 10 years when that happens we will need good engineers and if you have the wrong mindset from the beginning um the high probability we still have a lot of average engineers we should rather optimize in this country for 10 extremely good engineers than 1000 uh, you know average engineers or just you know struggling to find jobs which takes me to my last point there are two things you can be good at if you're in cs you can either cover breadth really well that means you know a lot of things but you're only able to push a product up until the last 90 to 95% and you can't really cover the last 5% yourself and then the second is depth which is people who don't really like doing easy things um and you know they'll just work on their very specific problem statement and they don't really care how the product is built around that um india lacks both at the moment we don't have enough people who have breadth of knowledge and can build you know polished products that are easy to build um the, i think what's required if you want to become a breadth engineer is a lot of attention to detail and doing a lot of boring things again and again um to help the product you know um to help for example make the product really beautiful or you know i don't know fix a margin that's uh, that's been stuck for a while or you know clean the code base up um this is one thing we can adapt over time um there's no reason why a product like cursor or lovable wouldn't come out of india there's not a lot of niche technical knowledge that only is available in a stanford or a harvard um, that's required for this these are fairly simple products but what they have is a lot of attention to detail um which if you are a breadth engineer uh, is something you need to focus on um the depth engineer a uh, person who's really good at you know i don't know writing blockchains or writing low level code or or writing their own models um is knowledge that will probably take time um i think this requires a solid ecosystem you know right from the ground level of how education is done and the kind of networks that we have and the kind of people that we have in the country that's mostly a long shot you know 5 to 10 years down the line is when we can hope to even you know see a blockchain come out of the country that does well or see a foundational model that's actually able to compete um you know at a global stage um china is there because chinese engineers are actually really good if you ever open github if you look at any small niche take web rtc for example you'll find a lot of projects who have their documentation in chinese have been written in chinese one of the biggest web rtc company agora is out of china um and this probably comes from a lot of math and getting computers early uh, we didn't have for the longest time but now we do um so there's some probability that a few years down the line we have um, engineers that can actually compete on bigger tam markets um at a global stage um right now we still can compete at the app layer uh, but again what's missing what you should have and that will also help you differentiate really well from other people in the market is just having breadth of knowledge being able to provide accountability being high agency and just do what a founder is asking you to do um giving them minimum headache uh, asking minimum questions and just being able to understand product um a lot of product learning um okay, you know given this product how should i build what needs to be built what not what needs to be built what doesn't need to be built um spending a lot of time there um is is you know sort of the need of the hour you just not need to be a scrappy engineer um and if you do that you know it's very easy to reach the top 1% or you know at least get a job fairly easily because that's the kind of talent that founders are looking for most startups in the country run at the app layer there's nothing crazy that they're building at least technically it's not a big challenge the challenge is finding engineers who can just maintain context and build what's been told to build um without a lot of iterations without breaking code and you know in a clean fashion be it back end or front end um, if you can do that you know then you're sort of up there in terms of people who are competing for jobs in conclusion number 1 um try to find network effects people unfair advantage that is able to get you that job if you're unemployed number 2 um don't focus on very big offers i do need an xyz offer right out of college um if you're first or second year get an internship if it pays 25k great third fourth year maybe optimize for bigger offers but if you're reaching close towards the end of your fourth year um then get whatever you can and hopefully you know if you have 
more than basic skills then you know 8 lpa 70k a month is like nothing crazy to ask for if you are graduated and unemployed then probably high time to get whatever you can once you join remember the ambition the grit that you had for you know an xyz offer and and make sure you're optimizing for that make sure if you want to be a breath engineer you have extreme attention to detail and you know uh, you're obviously becoming an engineer to rely on um, if you want depth then you know it'll actually become fairly easy for you uh, i think if there are not enough people who have depth of knowledge so it's very hard for companies to let them go um, good examples of these are you know devops engineers smart contract engineers Uh, low level engineers uh, infra engineers but friend one of these niches um, i think life is pretty sorted anyways if you want to remain at the app layer um, i think everyone can write code now it's about who can maintain the maximum context um, um, and who can provide value to the founder um, without you know um, them having to intervene and you know and just write clean stable code front end back end things like this opportunities are there but you'll have to move fast have the right networks and move fast with that we'll end it i'll see you guys in the next one bye bye